This week, we'll start speaking about the more advanced topics of OOP in Java. And the assumption is you have already completed part one and part two of the review tutorial series. If you have not completed them, please do so as soon as you can. Otherwise, you can easily get lost in the subsequent lectures. Let's now get on to the lecture. And I would like to start with exceptions, which is about the Java way uh, or the object-oriented way of handling errors. Okay, let's see what the learning outcomes are, and then we'll get on to the individual subtopics for the uh, exceptions. Okay, so this module is designed to help you learn about, number one, the caller versus the callee in a uh, method invocation. Whenever you're making a method call, you should really identify the caller and the callee so that we can analyze when you have a chain of method calls. You'll be, uh, you need this kind of uh, analysis in order for you to understand the behavior of runtime exceptions. And number two, we want to do error handling via console messages. I want to just give you some idea about how you can just uh, handle the errors using some system that are the print line. However, we need to identify its limitation as well before we move on to the uh, better way, which is about using exceptions. And to really use exceptions, you have to understand very well the catch or specify requirements, which I'll go into details. And I'll give you one example to build from scratch about either you want to handle or not to handle an exception whenever you are facing the choice. And we want to move on to the more effective way to handle er uh, errors by using runtime exceptions in Java. So that'll be the more systematic and object-oriented way. And what do we do when an exception is thrown at a runtime? So this is more like a general uh, principle to actually summarize when we uh, have seen the examples. And finally, I want to show you a little bit more examples on exception handling, including how you can somehow parse a string value into some integer value. It's a very common uh, problem that you can actually solve by using the standard exception handling mechanism. All right, so I would like to start with uh, the first topic about caller versus callee. And the easiest way is to, buy, uh, to learn about this is by using an example. Okay, let's say within the body of implementation of a method, which is what's really within the curly brackets, we may call other methods. That's a general uh, syntax you can write. Within the method, you may or may not actually call, want to call other methods. In the case of debugger, you can, of, of course, uh, you can either step over the method call or you can step into the method call, right? That's what we uh, learned in the review tutorial series. Let's now consider this example here. So uh, I will switch on to uh, switch to iPad in just a moment, but we want to define the idea about caller and callee. You can definitely read off the slides. I'll leave that to you, but I will. Uh, I'll like to do some visual illustration quickly. Okay. So we want to uh, talk about the difference between caller and callee. Okay, and just from the literal meaning, really. So you can think about the caller is really about the party who actually calls some other methods. So it is the party calling another method. What about callee? So for callee, let's say over here, it will be kind of the opposite uh, side of the, uh, the invocation. So it will be the other party. So you'll be the party being called. by another method. And just to say a little bit more, you can see that in the case of caller, party callee another method, that another method is indeed the callee. And in the case of the callee, party being called by another method, that another method is indeed the caller, right? Okay, just from the literal meaning, we can already see uh, how symmetric it is, okay? And let's now go over some definition about caller versus callee. So caller is the client's, client is about someone who's, who's gonna use the service from somebody else. So he's a client using the service provided by another method. So when, whenever I'm trying to call another method, I'm really trying to use the service that's provided by that method or the service provided by the callee. On the other hand, callee is really the supplier providing the service to another method. So in, in this case, let's say the callee will be the party being called by another method. So that means the supplier, uh, sorry, this will be the clients who's trying to use the service 
that's provided by the colleague. Okay, so that's uh, the definition. Let's see how we can apply this definition in the case of Java code. Let me give you the simplest example, and then I'll give you some question to think about, and then go over the answer with you. Let's see this fragment of code over here. We got the class C1. Under that, we actually got some mutated method. Let's not worry about public or private. Okay, just uh, assume everything uh, just without a modifier. So under class C1, we got another method M1. Inside M1, we are trying to create a an object uh, variable O, which will store the uh, reference of uh, any class, uh, the reference of any objects of type C2, right? We got C1 and C2 in the context. And notice the way I'm trying to, uh, I color them, right? Uh, I did it in a way that's kind of uh, consistent with uh, my definition. And then once we declare this variable and then store that, uh, store in it, so the address of some objects will say O.M2. So we're calling some method in the context of this particular uh, class and method. So here, context is really important. Let me write it down here. So when, whenever we want to identify the context of a method call or method invocation, either way, a method call or invocation, what should you identify to define the context? You, need, you want to identify two things. Okay, let me draw a little bit better. Number one, you want to have the class, the context class. And then number two, you want to have the context method. Okay, so in this case, you can see the context will be under the class C1, we are trying to call some another method within method M1. Okay, that's what we have. So this is the context of the method call. And we'll say that this is the caller. On the other hand, what about the callee? So how do we identify the context? Similarly, we're also gonna identify the uh, the class and the method that will define the callee. So how, would you do, how do we do that? So this is the method call, right? So this is the method call, and then we can say that this is the method that's being called, so we call the callee. But now, how do we define the context for the callee? The method being called is M2. That's actually very easy, right? So again, we need to have the class and also we need to have the method together they will define the context so what's the class and what's the method method in this case is simply just m2 and what about the class class will be the type of the context objects right in the review tutorial series we spoke about what it means to be a context object it's basically the objects upon which you're trying to invoke the method so this is the context objects and then the class over here would be the type of the context objects of the context objects. In this case, what's the type for O? Right? You can see easily the definition. The type for O would be simply C2. Okay, so that's why it would be C2. So now we got two contexts over here. One is over here about the caller is going to be uh, C1 and M1. So this is the caller. What about Kali? Kali will be C2 and also M2. All right. So that's about the uh, uh, relationship between caller and Kali in a particular method call. So here is one question for you to think about. Okay. Can a method be a caller and a Kali simultaneously? For example, you can see the method M1 under C1. Currently, as far as we, we can see, C1 and 1 is actually a caller. Can it be a callee as well? Question one, right? Question two, you can see uh, C2 and 2 is currently the callee. Can it be a caller as well, right? So that's a question. So you want to pause the video and try to uh, formulate your answer to the, sub, uh, the two sub question I just posed to you, and then I'll go over the answer with you. All right, assuming that you paused the video and thought about it, okay, the answer is yes to both. Let's see how. Right, it's uh, very important for your understanding, even though it's a little bit basic. Okay, you can see here C1 and 1 over here. So this is the caller. How can it be a callee at the same time? Well, as long as there's another class that will actually make a method call to C1 and 1, that would be uh, that would make it a callee at the same time. So let me make uh, make one example for you. Let's say class. Let me just say C3 over here. And then under class C3, 
we simply got another method. It can be uh, accessor, can be mutator. Uh, just for uh, simplicity, I'll just make a, a mutator. And then let's say n three. Inside n three, we are simply going to create an object c one. Let's say o is assigned to new. And then C1, I'm simply calling the default constructor, which is automatically available to every class. And then we can say O dot N1. So now can you see if uh, uh, if this will actually make uh, make uh, the caller of C1 and 1 also a callee at it simultaneously? It would indeed, because in this case, let me just color that correctly. You can see we have this particular method called O.M1. So the context for the method call, right? The context for the callee is actually method M1. What about the type for the context objects O? It would be C1. So indeed, so this will be the callee. And the callee will also be, and uh, you don't necessarily have to say class is this, and also method is this. A more convenient way, which I will follow uh, for this course would be, I can say the class name, and then dot the method name. I'll get it, I'm going to use this convention when I explain the method call or caller and callee uh, in the subsequent parts of the uh, of the module. So this will be c1 dot n1. So you can see that c1 n1 over here is a callee. At the same time, c1 n1 in this uh, particular context, it is a caller. So definitely it can be a caller and callee at the same time. And the second one, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you, but I'll give you a little bit of principle. Can, over here, let's say the callee in this case, uh, which is C2 M2. Can C2 M2 over here, can C2 dot N2 be a caller as well, simultaneously? The answer is yes, okay? Yes, but how do you actually exemplify that? What you will do is make some method call. In C2.M2. So you can go to the M2 definition in class C2 and then try to make some method call over there. Doesn't matter which call, uh, what callee it might be. As long as you can make C2M2 a caller, then you are basically satisfying this criteria. All right, so that's about uh, the uh, examples and definition for caller versus callee. It's a very important concept, yet simple uh, for you to understand. But uh, in the subsequent videos, we're gonna assume you are very familiar with caller versus callee. And then we'll speak about a chain of method calls when we talk about exceptions.